They've never brought that complaint before, even after signing, immediately or before signing the April agreement. We sacrificed a lot. We will continue to sacrifice until the end of this agreement. That's our commitment. But to complete that honor, honoring the agreement, we should kickstart what is mentioned in that agreement, which is we have to extend. But beyond that, we have the right to discuss and we, we demand to have the time to discuss and put our grievance in front of the group. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Monday, the 5th of July. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. OPEC breakdown. The UAE blocks the cartel's output decision, claiming that there is no need to extend production cuts to next year. Saudi Arabia insists that the extension must happen. China's tech crackdown continues. Beijing removes Didi from app stores as it widens its cybersecurity review. Three other online platforms are now in the firing line. And stay tuned with the early edition. We'll discuss today's big themes with the Goldman Sachs head of commodities, Jeff Curry, and economist and author, Dambiza Moyo. So there's a crisis in OPEC Plus as Saudi Arabia pushes back against the UAE's opposition to a proposed production increase. In an unprecedented move, both countries have aired their grievances on television. First, let's hear from the UAE Energy Minister, Sohail al Mazroy. And just to be clear then, sir, you've not threatened to leave OPEC and right now, you're not prepared to threaten to leave if you don't get a deal. No, I think I think if we don't get a deal, then we have an agreement to to fulfil. We are not we are not now close even to elapsing that agreement. We are not threatening to walk away from the agreement. We are not threatening. We haven't threatened anyone. UAE okay. is not going to be an obstacle in front of anyone. But we are not going to threaten. That is not our strategy. We okay. are, we, we have been sacrificed, we sacrificed a lot. We will continue to sacrifice until the end of this agreement. That's our commitment. But beyond that, we have the right to discuss and we, we demand to have the time to discuss and put our grievance in front of the group. Well, Saudi Arabia's energy minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, also spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Harder. I would emphasize that it is the whole group mm -hmm. versus one country, uh, uh, which is uh, which is sad to me. But uh, this is the reality today. And how concerned are you if there is no agreement, and potentially we could see what we saw last year, which becomes a price war? We we have an existing agreement, Mary. I keep reminding people. Unlike what you had in March, we have an existing agreement. We will honor that agreement. We will continue with it. The agreement requires that we bring more production, yes. But to complete that honor, honoring the agreement, we should kickstart what is mentioned in that agreement, which is we have to extend. Again, the extension put people, lots of people in their comfort zone. It brings volumes to address the, the short term. But it also addressed for the market. Check with all those who are participant uh, in this market. Tell the them. The current should, agreement, if maybe not if, extended, has no production increase for August. So if not every member signs up tomorrow, what happens in August? Well, it's your chance to have an, another maybe interview to, with me tomorrow or after tomorrow. It depends on how we will finish. Are you worried we could see a massive spike in prices? Because the market is in need of more supply for the month of August. If some people would like to have that, they, they, they can do that. Is, is it our uh, uh, intent? No. Because if it is our intent, why would we do the proposal? And why we would work with our colleagues? It's been a two months affair. If you're on board with the proposal, Russia and the rest of OPEC is, and there's just one holdout, and that's the UAE, will you mm -hmm. continue to increase by 400,000 barrels a day without the UAE on board? We cannot, because it's an agreement that is done by consensus. 
Our exclusive there with the Saudi energy minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, on the spat driving OPEC+. Plus. Now, coming up later in the program, we'll also be speaking with Jeff Curry. He's global head of commodities research at Goldman Sachs to get his view on what the row could actually mean for oil markets. For the moment, it's quite a lot of drama, and it's also driving uh, the price of oil. Don't miss that conversation. Now, joining us now is Peter Kinsella. He's a global head of FX strategy at Union Bancaire Privé. Peter, as always, thank you so much for joining us. There is actually actually so much drama surrounding OPEC plus and the possible price of oil. Does that translate into maybe what you would do for FX that's tied to oil? Basically, if you look at money... I think we're just having a couple of difficulties. I don't know whether it's me that can't hear Peter or whether everyone can also hear him with a very loud echo. We'll get back to Peter shortly. Peter Kinsella, global head of FX strategy at Union Bancaire Privé. Now, coming up, we also look at China. We also look at tech. China's tech crackdown continues. Beijing has banned ride-hailing giant Didi from app stores days after its US IPO. And then a little bit later, we were just talking about it with Peter Kinsella. Uh, we talk more about OPEC Plus and the crisis, the standoff between Saudi Arabia and the UAE leaves oil markets in a limbo. We'll speak with Jeff Curry shortly. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Chinese President Xi Jinping, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and France's Emmanuel Macron are expected to hold a video call this week. The meeting comes as tensions simmer between Europe and the world's second largest economy over human rights and democracy issues. Now, President Biden has celebrated what he called a heroic U.S. vaccination campaign in a speech on the 4th of the July holiday. Biden declared the U.S. had achieved independence from the coronavirus, though he cautioned against complacency as more transmissible variants do circulate. We never again want to be where we were a year ago today. So today, while the virus hasn't been vanquished, we know this, it no longer controls our lives, it no longer paralyzes our nation, and it's within our power to make sure it never does again. Here in the UK, Boris Johnson will urge Britons to exercise judgment to protect themselves from COVID after the final unlocking of the economy in two weeks' time. The Prime Minister will set out the last stage of his roadmap of lockdown for England at a press conference happening later today. The country is seeing soaring transmission of the Delta variant, but so far without high levels of hospitalizations. And German Finance Minister Olaf Scholz says countries holding out against a global corporate tax deal will eventually come around because of the widespread support it has been receiving. Ireland, Hungary and Estonia are among those currently refusing to back that plan. 130 states agreed. They are more than 90 percent of world GDP, so this is something. And on the other hand, I'm know that even in the past many countries that were not supporting the proposals right from the beginning later um, supported them. There is a big train now on the track and I think it will continue to go to its aim. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, coming up, we'll be speaking with Jeff Curry, Global Head of Commodities Research at Goldman Sachs, to get his views on what the row at OPEC could mean for oil markets. If you have any questions, and I know you do, uh, feel free to write in IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. <clears throat> I don't think we have Leanne, actually. Let me read you the first words, and then uh, we'll have plenty more, of course, on everything that's going on with OPEC. Now, raw material prices surge in the wake of pandemic and disrupt the supply chain. European companies are pushing up prices. That's what industry bosses told Bloomberg's Caroline Conant at the Aix-en-Provence Economic Conference over the weekend. Here they are. We see some shortages um, when uh, the economy is uh, catching up, exiting from the crisis on a worldwide basis. And we have shortages of boats, uh, containers, uh, some raw materials, and uh, the entire upstream supply chain has been uh, disturbed. The impact for us is we see some of our input costs uh, rising, uh, but fortunately the machine brand is very strong and we are able to pass it to our customers. So the consumers, the customers, will end up paying the price? Yes. At the end, it's always the customers that pay the price. So how much does that represent in terms of increase of price for the customers? It's, um, we have rose our prices uh, twice already, um, once uh, early March and the second time um, in early July. It's around uh, 6 to 8 percent cumulative. Um, more generally, what's uh, the impact of inflation on the transport sector? Um, let me give you a, an example. The, the price of a container shipped from uh, Singapore to US was um, pre-COVID in 2019, end of 2019, at $2,400. Now it's at $9,800. So you're expecting a 2023 uh, recovery. Uh, do you think the Delta variant could derail this forecast? Of course, but the, the, the world is, uh, everybody is anticipating that we are already on the exit, and I'm still saying we are still in crisis. Uh, we have uh, India is still in massive problems. Uh, the entire South America is in big turmoil. The Southeast Asia, excluding China, has not vaccined, and they, only start, they have started only a few days ago. And uh, therefore, the economy is not yet uh, back to its normal level. So, so um, the Delta may have an impact, uh, may slow down the recovery uh, in Europe and uh, in the US, but I trust that uh, we would be able to vaccine, uh, vaccinate more people, and therefore we should exit this. Uh, but in terms of economic recovery, I'm not anticipating anything happening before second semester 2022. That was the Michelin chief executive officer speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Caroline Conan in Aix-en-Provence. You could almost hear the cicadas in that beautiful background. Now joining us to talk about FX is Peter Kinsella, third time lucky Peter, global head of FX strategy <laughs> at Union Bancaire <laughs> Privé. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. We're in good shape. Talk to me a little bit about um, you know, some of the currencies that are linked to oil. How much do they, do, 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 you know, how volatile will they be actually until we get an agreement or until it's dead in the water? Okay. Uh, nice, nice to speak with you, Francine. I think if we look at oil currency, so if you look at, sort of, you know, the ruble, you look at Norwegian krona and certainly uh, the Canadian dollar, um, in recent days have weakened somewhat just ahead of this, this meeting. Um, and, you know, that's surprising in a sense because if, if we look at how these currencies are trading relative to oil, they do appear to be trading very, very cheaply. In particular, uh, the, the, the ruble. It's, it's trading way below levels that we would sort of consider, uh, you know, to be highly correlated with Russian terms of trade. Similar story with uh, with the Canadian dollar. Um, you know, the current oil price is seventy five dollars a barrel. It's kind of consistent with dollar CAD trading below one twenty. So um, certainly, I think that the, the main oil producers do appear to be trading, you know, very, very cheap relative to their terms of trade. And um, but that does suggest, you know, that there, there will be. A a, I think definitely a catch-up trade if we do see OPEC come towards some kind of an agreement in the coming days. Yeah, I know you sent a chart, Peter, and we love that actually guests come with charts. I mean, it's it's actually looking at the terms of trade in, in the I think in the ruble. Um, when you look at trade yeah. in general, does it pick up because of the recovery, or is it still uncertain because of the variants? 
Um, I think certainly on, on, as regards the, the the recovery, it's basically sort of a, increasingly both a demand and a supply story, right? So what we see certainly is, is a return of some consumer demand, and, and certainly sort of uh, the aviation sector. You know, likewise, we're seeing this you know large, I'd say long long running decline in, in global oil inventories. So that's all sort of indicative of, of a return of demand. But we're still looking at a relatively tight supply backdrop, and, and consequently, I think that in my view, at least, it, it will lead to sort of a, an increase in, in in prices over the short term. Um, and it does seem as though oil is pretty well supported. We've gone from this trading range of, you know, sort of 35 to $50 a barrel, and now we're kind of in somewhere between 55 and 75 We may even crack that little bit higher. So, yeah. um, you know, overall, I, I do think that's consistent with an appreciation story for these currencies. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Peter Kinsella, the global head of FX strategy at Union Bancaire Privé. Now, for more on OPEC and all things oil, I'm delighted to be joined by Jeff Curry. He's global head of commodities at Goldman Sachs. Jeff, as always, thank you for joining us, especially on a day where we see so much drama with oil. How will this be resolved? Well, let's look at the two oppositions on the, both sides. You have UAE on one side. They want a higher baseline to better reflect the investment they've made in their production capacity. Um, but it's a large number. They want to go up 700,000 barrels per day to something around 3.85 million barrels per day. Now, why is Saudi opposed to that? Because it would change the quotas of many of the other producers, uh, most likely downward, and Russia would be the one that they don't want to actually offend in this process. So when we look at the standoff, the most likely outcome and the outcome that the market's pricing in right now is the deal that they proposed last week with no extension past April 22. Um, that then gives time for UAE to argue for a higher baseline. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about you know, their commitment to the deal, the main view here is that both sides remain committed, um, which means there's a yeah. low probability of this thing unraveling with a large increase in production similar to what we saw um, a little over a year ago. So we would view, but, you know, the risk here more to the upside. But if it did fall apart, it's important to remember that one of the members here is arguing for higher production. But our base case here is we get a deal today. That's what the market's pricing in. And it's probably one where you have no extension past April 22. But Jeff, I mean, we, we talk, you know, we heard from the Saudi energy minister talking about precedent. I mean, this is a pretty big drama for OPEC+. Plus. Could this be the dispute that dissolves OPEC+. Plus? Well, we, we look at OPEC+, Plus, including Russia and the non-OPEC members. It was a temporary three-phase production deal to deal with the um, drop in demand around uh, you know, around the, the, the COVID. In terms of thinking about the long-term longevity of it, you know, the core of this really is OPEC. And the dispute we're talking about is within two allies. Yes, it's high-level diplomacy yeah. between two allies, but the core of this is OPEC, GCC countries, which are at the center of OPEC, which will be, has been around and will be around long after this current deal that was focused on dealing with COVID. But so will OPEC stay, Jeff? I mean, I, you know, I used to cover OPEC like 15, 20 years ago. This feels very personal. It's really two members that won't budge. And, you know, the question is also why is the market taking it so calmly for now? Well, I mean, you, you had a proposal put out last night by um, UAE that talked about, hey, let's, let's not extend it past April 22, because the deal that was proposed last week was an extension past April 22 to the end of next year. So by, um, by throwing out this, this compromise where you don't extend past April 22, it provides uh, more room for negotiation for UAE to be able to establish a higher baseline. Why did it become so hostile so fast? Why did it escalate? I mean, Saudi Arabia went as far to say as it's, you know, the, the whole of OPEC against one country. Oh, well, this has been an issue that UAE has been bringing up now for, you know, going back through the, the, the last year or so. Now, in terms of why um, Saudi Arabia is opposed to it, Saudi Arabia is opposed to it because you have so many other members that they have worked around to create a quota system that is agreed upon. But I think the key point here is that OPEC has always operated around this idea, unanimous consent around 
um, any type of arrangement. So in terms of trying to get you know the, the, this last party in line, I think that's part of the reason why they're so aggressive in trying to do this, because ultimately, because you think about what happened with this initial deal, you ended up having to have, you know, President Trump at the time get involved to get Mexico across the line. So, you know, this whole idea of having unanimous consent, I think, is a it's a long-standing history within the many of these OPEC agreements. No, you're right. And last year we had a pretty punishing price war between, you know, Russia and Saudi Arabia, but we all know how, how volatile that was and how that ended up. Could I, I know you're pretty confident that there will be some kind of agreement, but could we see a repeat of what we saw last year? Extremely unlikely. It's not in anybody's interest at this point right now. Demand is very strong. Um, we estimate the market is, was in a de deficit of 2.3 million barrels per day in the month of June. That's the highest level since last summer when we were coming out of that COVID crisis. Um, demand is surging ahead with the summer travel season. Supply outside of core OPEC is nearly inelastic. Um, so the market environment today is probably the best we've seen in decades. So it's very unlikely that you would see one of these parties jeopardize this opportunity right now by starting a price war. We think the risks are very much skewed to the upside. And let's just remember, all of the production capacity, the spare capacity, mostly exists inside of core OPEC, meaning the GCC countries. Um, this is a very unique situation because you have not seen investment in the shale. Um, you know, non-OPEC ex-U.S. production is in decline in many parts of the world. Um, so in terms of looking at strong demand on one side, inelastic supply curve outside of core OPEC, very sharp declines in inventories, you know, this is a very unique opportunity for the market. And if you are, you know, sitting in GCC countries right now, you don't want to squander that opportunity. So from a game theory perspective, it's not in their interest. So, Jeff, where do you see the price of oil going? You know, our base case is $80 a barrel during the third quarter, but that means spikes above to the upside above that to average 80. You know, can it be in the 85 to $90 a barrel range? Um, particularly before you get to Labor Day, this market's going to be tight given the surge in travel demand that we're seeing, both in terms of air as well as on ground, um, suggests that demand's going to remain strong. At the same time, there's no supply increases in sight. You, you know, the drilling in the U.S. shale patch is not sufficient to grow production going into year in. Then you look at the Iranian deal right now. You know, it's difficult to imagine to see Iranian supplies before, you know, let's say October, November at the earliest right now. So this market's going to remain tight during the summer months. Jeff, if it goes above 90, does it actually, how much does it hurt the world recovery? The, the global economy is very strong right now. I like to point this out. You know, you have uh, gasoline at the retail level in the United States in that 4 to $5 a gallon range in different parts of the United States. Have you heard a peep out of people in the U.S. or out of the U.S. president like typically you would see in this environment? The answer is no, which is an indication that the underlying economic environment is relatively strong and allows the system to be able to handle these higher prices. Jeff, what surprised you the most and actually how this, you know, how this escalated? I know I keep on going back to, you know, what exactly happened over the last week, why it escalated so quickly, and why you're so confident that actually, you know, it won't break down completely. It just goes down to the fact it's in nobody's interest for a complete breakdown, given how strong the underlying fundamentals are. When you think about the breakdown that happened going back, you know, a little over a year ago, the underlying fundamentals were incredibly weak. So one party had the capability to be able to create a huge decline in prices because it basically used the fundamentals in its, you know, to help, you know, a tailwind to help in creating that downdraft in prices. Today, you're fighting a fundamental, a very tight fundamental picture, um, which means if you want to try to make this market go down, you're going to need a lot. Let's just look at it. You, if, if you think about the overall um, deficit is 2.3 million barrels per day. If you just want to get this thing into a surplus right now, you as one producer would need to add more than 2.3 million barrels per day. Um, going back to a little over a year ago, you didn't need to add much. You just pushed the market off the cliff. Today, it's a really tight market, and it would be an uphill battle to be able to create that surplus to create a, you know, a, a pricey more similar to what we saw a year ago. So it's just, it's not, it's a very difficult, tall ask to, to create right now, and it's not in anybody's interest. 
Jeff, on commodities in general, and, and certainly some of the commodities that actually are needed for the energy transition, are we underinvesting? Are we going to have a crisis in you know, 6, 10, 18 months because we're just not investing enough and so we won't be able to pull some of the stuff out of the ground? I, it, it is shocking how tight every single one of these markets are, whether if it was agriculture with the with the acreage report that came out last week, or it's the metals markets, you know, lack of greenfield capex, maintenance capex, inventories declining, or it's the power and gas markets in California, Europe, even in China, power and gas markets are tight. So the, in terms of looking at the overall ability to grow supply, the situation in oil is not unique. The problem exists in agriculture, it exists in metals, um, and it exists in power and gas. And it's unlikely to change because of the in any time in the near future. Many of these companies are focused on return on equity for the first time in, you know, some cases decades. Um, so, you know, if you use the example of what happened in the 2000s, the bull market started in 03, and you didn't see a big increase in oil capex till 06 and metals capex till 08. Um, and at this point right now, we've seen a huge run up in prices over the last 12 months. And in terms of looking at big increases in capex and investment, we haven't really seen any. Jeff, thanks so much, uh, as always, for Great. your wisdom. Jeff, thank Curry, you for the having global me. Head of commodities at Goldman Sachs. Now, three unlikely EU countries are resisting the global call for revamp of corporate tax. Hungary, Estonia, and Ireland are challenging proposals for a worldwide minimum rate, even as 130 countries backed the deal at last week's OECD talks. Now, this week's G20 meeting may prove crucial to a breakthrough, but Germany's Olaf Scholz says the tax agreement is a matter of when rather than if. 130 states agreed. They are more than 90% of world GDP, so this is something. And on the other hand, I know that even in the past, many countries that were not supporting the proposals right from the beginning later um, supported them. There is a big train now on the track, and I think it will continue to go to its aim. And as countries hash out the details of what a global corporate tax might be or might mean, boards and huge multinationals like Google, Facebook and Amazon will have to add the proposals to their agendas. <laughs> well, joining us now to discuss further is Dambiza Moyo, economist and author of How Boards Work and How They Work Better in a Chaotic World. So congratulations again, Dambiza. On the book, there's so many questions that I have on you, from uh, global taxes to, of course, what we're seeing in terms of recovery to some of the things that worry you. Overall, are boards and companies looking at the right things, or is there a worry that there's a black swan out there that they don't see coming, like cyber attack, that could actually put them flat on their feet? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I think it, what you're asking is a very important question because ultimately we can't just focus on tactics in order to run these businesses. We need to think about the more structural long-term challenges. So what do I mean by that? Clearly, in the past 18 months, as we ought to do all the time, we've been thinking about the safety of workers, keeping the proverbial lights on and making sure that we've got solid balance sheets to race through um, what was a, a very tough period, um, certainly over the last uh, few months. Um, but we have to also cannot lose sight of the more structural challenges like capital allocation, which we know um, time and time again will determine the sort of winners from the losers. And that becomes very murky in an environment which is uncertain, not just in the short term, but also in the long term because of the rise of China, issues such as tax, as you just uh, mentioned, the, the sort of broader environment around low economic growth prospects, environmental concerns, demographics, inequality, et cetera. So there are lots of headwinds, um, but corporations, I think, need to really focus on that long-term proposition just as much as they're thinking about the short term, and that can be very difficult and a delicate balance to hold. Yeah, and Dabiza, I guess the question is how much are they thinking about longer term as opposed to short term, uh, given also we're you know, just in a recovery phase, there's still variants that people are uncertain about, and so it's unclear what corporations need to do. Yeah, so I think on a, on a it varies from a company by the company basis. I mean, if I can be a bit uh, cheeky about it, I would say we'll know who's been focusing on the long term uh, in in you know another five years because those companies that are actually putting money to work. Just picking up on Jeff's comments a moment ago regarding um, the sort of structural uh, shortages, whether it's in semiconductors or in commodities, companies are going to have to make those types of investments today in order to reap rewards in five, ten, fifteen years. But I there 
obviously putting your gas mask on now is has been really important as companies have tried to figure out how to keep employees working. So I would say the boardrooms in which I sit, we are equally um, focused on short term versus long term. And I hope other companies are doing the same. Um, what, Dambiza, is the one thing that actually you think we've made progress on in the last 12 to 14 months? I know you've done a lot of work on, you know, minorities. You've done a lot of work on also, for example, the relationship between developed economies and developing economies. Are things getting better for the disadvantaged or are they actually getting worse? Well, even before COVID hit in earnest in 2020, um, we were already worried about low economic growth, um, the sort of prospects for growth and, and subsequently, obviously, returns and equities, but also more generally issues of uh, climate change and inequality were already uh, problematic. And, and add to that um, levels of debt and sort of the impotence of public policy, both on monetary and fiscal policy. So in that respect, COVID has really accelerated a lot of the trauma that we were expecting and anticipating. Um, if, if you ask me what have we learned, I mean, clearly, um, if, 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 uh, if what I say is, is right, which I do believe, um, that we are accelerating some of the challenges that we were anticipating, such as digitization, that's something that we've, we've learned from live by having to have workers deployed um, around, uh, you know, around the world um, in their homes and in different environments, um, of, you know, not just thinking about what the cyber risks and the downside are, but what opportunities they are for a work from home going forward. But your question around uh, emerging markets, developing countries, I think is really important because, you know, as, as euphoric and in some sense, as Jeff sounded about a recovery, um, I think that there's still a lack of clarity of when and how emerging market economies, whether it's in South America, Africa, Asia, will come on board, um, given the sort of uh, issues with variants, but also around vaccine deployment. So I think we're still not clear in terms of timing around that. There's no doubt about it that there's definitely a surge in the U.S. in terms of markets and macro, but I would be more um, sort of less sanguine, I should say, about the prospects uh, in the next 18 months vis-a-vis uh, -vis emerging markets. Dambiza, does working from home actually, does it help with productivity across the world? So could it actually be beneficial to certain economies because people are more productive, but does it, you know, again, leave more people behind in developed economies? Well, there's a wonderful paper that just came out from the University of Chicago, which basically um, argues I'm putting it in shorthand, but essentially that uh, there is a reduction in productivity from people working from home. I'm sure for every report that says that, there's going to be another report that says uh, work from home is, is either flat, the effects are either flat or even beneficial. So I don't think we're going to know the answer for some time. If you ask me specifically what I think about, um, you know, uh, uh, work from home, I worry a lot about um, sort of uh, the, the aspects of, uh, of becoming a great worker and really participating in bigger decisions that senior leadership have to make such a, as risk and uh, setting goals of the company if you're not absolutely engaged on a more regular basis in the office, um, learning how to navigate team dynamics, learning how to manage people, et cetera, and, and thinking more broadly about risk and uh, and uh, and goals. So, you know, uh, we can go back and forth, and perhaps it's a generational thing, because I'm much more, uh, you know, older, and I, I grew up on in companies when, uh, you know, working at, at the office was is hugely beneficial, and I think that that still remains the same, notwithstanding the fact that it might depend a lot on whether you're creative or whether you're, um, you know, dialing and uh, from uh, for sales uh, from sales conferences from home. So I think there's a lot of um, murkiness still. Um, and let's see what happens in September. You know, once we see a, a reduction in in a stimulus and, and and people deciding whether or not they're going to go back to work for sure. Dambiza, thank you so much as always for joining us. Economist and author of How Boards Work, Dambiza Moyo there. Now, coming up, China's tech crackdown continues. Beijing has banned ride-hailing giant Didi from app stores days after its U.S. IPO. All of the details are up next. This is Bloomberg. Alex, I'm so thrilled to be here to finally celebrate our nation's first day and to celebrate the return of live performances. Yes. Country road, take me home. 
come on and go with me. Well, no hatred. Come go with me. Some of our coverage there for the July the 4th celebration at the Boston Pops. U.S. stock and bond markets are, of course, closed today for Independence Day. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Garrett. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Shares in supermarket group Morrison have soared this morning after Apollo Global Management confirmed it is evaluating a possible offer for the company. Over the weekend, the U.K. grocer agreed to a £6.3 billion offer from a consortium led by four investment group. The deal is at a premium of more than 42% to the Morrison closing price prior to a first bid for the group. Shares in Sydney Airport have soared after a 17 billion US dollar takeover offer from a group including IFM investors in one of the boldest bets on a recovery for global travel. The consortium's offer for Australia's largest airport is at a 42% premium to the previous closing price, though still below the level it traded before the pandemic. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, China is expanding its cybersecurity to review of tech firms. Right-hailing giant Didi was removed from app stores on Sunday, just days after its U.S. listing. The Chinese government-backed Global Times newspaper says Beijing is acting for national security reasons. Well, joining us now is Sofia Orta, a Costa Bloomberg's China reporter in Hong Kong. Sofia, thank you for joining us. So what do we actually know about the probe into Didi? Hi, uh, uh, good morning, Francine. Um, so what we know so far is the cyberspace regulator. This is a new body in China. Uh, as you said on Sunday, ordered all app stores to remove DD from their platforms. It's important to note that it hasn't banned existing users from using the app, so it's still not as aggressive as Beijing could be. Um, obviously, um, New York markets won't trade on Monday, but we already knew that Beijing was looking into the company, and we already saw a reaction on Friday. Friday, with the shares falling as much as 11 percent, Francine. So, Sophia, the probe was launched just a few days after Didi's IPO. What's the reaction amongst investors? So what we're hearing, and the, and the comparison here, obviously, is with Ant Group. That was the other big IPO in November. Um, it was set to be the world's biggest IPO ever. Uh, we had $3 trillion worth of subscriptions for that stock. And as you remember, Francine, that was actually canned by Beijing two days before. So the question is, really, why did um, Chinese authorities wait for the stock to start trading in New York? And that's the interesting uh, difference here. It really is a lesson for U.S. investors, um, there is a sense that perhaps, um, you know, there was kind of a nod from uh, regulators in China or, or kind of a suggestion that Didi shouldn't go ahead with its IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, um, even though the regulator in China doesn't have the power to kind of cancel that IPO like it did for Ant. It can kind of guide companies and suggest, uh, you know, maybe it is a bad time, it's a bad window for you to be doing this. Uh, but importantly, you know, all of this uh, came after the stock was already listed. Um, so there is kind of a sense, of, you know, was this kind of a lesson for the company? Was it a lesson for U.S. investors that are, in, that are looking to buy these Chinese shares? And is Beijing angry at the company uh, for selling shares in New York and not in mainland exchanges or in Hong Kong and not listening to the warnings that, um, you know, this was a company that was under intense regulatory scrutiny and it has been for, um, for at least 10 months. So, Sophia, are we, um, are, are we going to see other I mean, it, it's not only, right, about DD. How many more others are touched, actually? 
Yes, exactly. So this is part of a very, very broad crackdown. These are companies that have grown, uh, ex you know, extremely rapidly. Uh, remember, in China, there isn't really a regulatory structure. There's no comprehensive oversight of these tech giants who have amassed not just, you know, a, a, a huge amount of, of capital. These, these are really valuable companies, but also an enormous amount of data. And that is now the focus for regulator, regulators in Beijing. What do they do with all this data? Um, you know, especially if it is in the hands of U.S. investors, which is the concern kind of flagged by the global, influential Global Times editor. This is a company that has um, half a billion daily users, uh, sorry, I should say annual users, and it has so much um, data on Chinese, uh, you know, Chinese citizens. Should it really be in the hands of U.S. investors, any Chinese company with access to this data looking to IPO in the U.S. is unlikely to do so, uh, I would say, Francine. Sophia, thanks so much. Sophia Arta Acosta, Bloomberg's China reporter in Hong Kong. Now, coming up, oil markets are in turmoil after the UAE blocks OPEC's output deal. A positive jobs report, though, pushes the S&P 500 to a record for a seventh day. We'll get more on the markets next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the oil fuel standoff between Saudi Arabia and the UAE is deepening. Abu Dhabi says it won't accept a plan to extend the output curbs beyond April 2022 unless it's given better terms, while the Saudis say they won't give in to those demands. Well, let's get more on the story. Our daybreak anchor, Manus Kranny, joins us now for more from Dubai. Manus, so you also spoke to the UAE uh, minister yesterday. What's the risk of a no deal here? Well, the language from Sahil al Mazrui was, we're not threatening anybody. We want to be treated a little bit more fairly. Mm -hmm. Listening into your conversation with Goldman Sachs and Jeff Curry, it's the principle of unanimous consent. And that's what His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman made the point. It is one against the rest of the OPEC Plus group. And herein lies the rub. Um, he says that it's sad. And what even mystifies me is that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, not physically talking to one another. They chose to communicate to the market via Bloomberg television for the Emiratis. This is what he had to say to me, Francine. It's making two decisions. One of them is immediate. That is the production increase, Francine, of 400,000 barrels a day, which won't even cover the deficit, according to Kerry. That's required. The luxury, Francine, is that of the extension. And it's the extension that is the rub. And this is where it's all for one and it's against the UAE at the moment. And Francine, if I can just encapsulate what's at risk here, it's 15 months of credibility building. That's yeah. what OPEC Plus yeah. have managed to do since the implosion in Vienna. Yeah, I mean, it is a real risk, actually, you know, not only credibility, but at the end of the day, kind of are we risking the recovery if the price of oil goes too high? Well, $80, $85 is achievable, according to Goldman's in your interview, by the third quarter. Now, where is demand destruction? And in the middle of the Masrui interview, and I've never heard a minister really as impassioned as this, for God's sake, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And, and this is the tonality of it. This shows you the tacit acceptance by the UAE of the need to extend production. However, it's how do you get there? The compromise is April 2022. The Saudis are playing the long game for Christmas of next year. That's what they say it makes sense and give everybody the comfort zone. The language used by the Emiratis this time around is not one about walking away. We're not threatening. So this is going to be excruciating, painful, long negotiation today and maybe a very late press conference. What is the elegant solution, Francine? Well, that's down to the Emiratis and the Saudis to work out. How do you bluff a market when it's very obvious <laughs> there's a chasm between the two of you? Manus, thank you so much. Manus Cranny there in Dubai. Now, let's talk about the markets in general now with Bloomberg's Eddie van der Waal. Eddie, I mean, uh, it's all about the oil price for the moment, right? If the Saudis hold firm and there's an oil price spike, uh, could that force central bankers to then turn more hawkish sooner? So is this, is this a domino effect? 
I, I think so. Look, I think there is absolutely so much riding on this OPEC uh, meeting today. You know, uh, people can talk about how quiet the markets are, given the, the U.S. holiday and so on. But if you take the, the implications of this OPEC meeting alone, the significance of it is just phenomenal. Because if we do see, if we do see a breakdown of, of relations and we do see this dragging on for another day or another, you know, throughout towards towards the end of the week and we we do see at the end of it um an, a substantial increase in pumping from opec then what we see is we take we, see, we get all of those inflationary pressures that have been building up and and they get relieved quite a, you know quite significantly and then you know that takes the pressures of the central bankers and the central bankers can say hang on a second we can let this economy um you know we can jo let the the job creation um run a little bit longer before we start putting the brakes on it really changes the, the dynamic of yeah. the conversation. So, Eddie, how will the continued strength of so the US I think economy this actually play? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, 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 Francine, carry on. No, sorry, I, I think we're actually going in the same direction. I was going to ask you how this all plays into the Fed's thinking on inflation. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the Fed, you know, I think the Fed will be keeping a very close eye on on oil prices because it's such a big in, input into the into the global economy, into the supply chain pressures that we've seen, into the cost of moving shipping. All of these things are impacted by by the oil price. So I think this is absolutely the key the key element for me for today. At the same time, we're seeing those flash PMIs from Europe coming in today, and they've they're running a little bit hot. They, you know, we're still seeing readings around sixty. So, and I think. You know, I think uh, most central bankers would be would be comfortable with that as long as the inflationary pressures are just taken off. And therefore, uh, you know, um, I, I, it's nice to see a united OPEC. But at the yeah. same time, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of a little bit more pumping would be uh, welcomed around the world, too. Eddie, thank you so much, so much, Eddie van der Valt there. I don't know whether we're bearing the leads. I want to know whether Mrs. van der Valt has yet agreed to a puppy or not. We'll get Eddie back to see, to answer that very important question on this Monday morning, July the 5th. So Bloomberg Surveillance continues in the next hour. I'll be joined by Matt and Danny for a latest roundup of the markets. This is Bloomberg. They've never brought this complaint before, even after signing immediately or before signing the April agreement. We sacrificed a lot. We will continue to sacrifice until the end of this agreement. That's our commitment. But to, to complete that honor, honoring the agreement, we should kickstart what is mentioned in that agreement, which is we have to extend. But beyond that, we have the right to discuss and we, we demand to have the time to discuss and put our grievance in front of the group. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, good morning, everyone. 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, July the 5th. Our top stories today. High stakes standoff. Saudi Arabia and the UAE ramp up the tension in their OPEC dispute over oil production. China, China tightens its grip. Beijing expands its latest crackdown on the tech industry beyond ride-hailing giant Didi. And Joe Biden's mission accomplished moment. The president all but announces an end to the pandemic in the U.S. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Danny Berger in for Kaylee Lines, who's off today. Danny, I don't know whether we say, like, happy July the 5th or happy the day after July the 4th, but to all of our American friends, we hope we had a wonderful weekend. Yeah, happy day after Independence, happy hangover Independence Day. I'm not totally sure what it is, but hey, if the U.S. is off, then I guess it's some sort of celebration. And we do have cash markets closed in the U.S., but of course, we have futures trading, we have drama in OPEC, so that's certainly what's guiding markets so far. So let me show you those. Looking at Brent crude, it had been stuck in a range slightly higher today, about its highest since 2018, more than $76 a barrel. The potential risks here of OPEC are so disparate. You have at one end potentially the current agreement just continuing through, which would be really bullish for the markets, or you have a complete breakdown, a complete free-for-all, uh, which would definitely uh, be a more bearish scenario. So it's, it's, it's a kind of paralyzed trading that we're seeing. As I said, futures still trading in the U.S. You have S&P futures down by a tenth of a percent. You have the seventh consecutive 
consecutive high uh, ending on Friday after that jobs data. You have a 10-year bond, which is having a slight bit. Again, volumes really, really light here, given it's a holiday. And you do have a little bit of weakness coming through to the dollar. That weakness starting after the jobs data. This idea of a Goldilocks data coming through that is positive for the economy, but not enough to get the Fed moving. Now, the other market story we're also tracking today is China, and they continue to crack down on big tech. This time around, it's right hailing at Didi. But look at today's session, really remarkable. We start the day basically unchanged, a little bit weaker after this lunchtime break. But as we end the day, Chinese shares, the SCI 300, uh, 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 CSI 300 rather, ending the day higher, tech even ending the day higher as well. Now, finally, uh, the market's over here in Europe, seeing a little bit of weakness starting through in this morning. Just fractional here, though, seven basis points lower. One thing that is helping to lead the index higher is the basic resource sector just because commodities and oil are stronger today and finally when it comes to companies Matt I know you're gonna be obsessed with this story because as you always say the UK loves a good grocery story WM Morrison first getting a bid from CDNR that bid then one upped uh, from Fortress Investments and then finally we get a new bid or a potential bid with Apollo looking at them uh, we're also seeing grocery store Marks and Spencer's raise higher but Matt I would put it to you every single private equity firm that is bidding for Morrison's is American so I would say Americans yeah. are more obsessed with UK grocery stores I than would Britain's say are. so I, yep. I, I'm totally on board with you. <laughs> to me, this says that the UK cares a little bit less about their own assets than other players. Mm. And wouldn't it be ironic, post-Brexit, right, you want to leave the European Union and fend for yourselves, but then foreigners come in and buy all of your assets, right. which is why? Do you not have the money? Is there no appetite for supermarket mm -hmm. assets? Is it enough to have Tesco, Waitrose, and Sainsbury? Don't you want Morrison's as well? Every little helps, you know? So, um, yeah. I love it. The ultra-liberal now kind of like pushing for protectionism in the UK. I love it. Happy July 5th. I, <laughs> not protectionism, just a little bit of national pride is what I'm <laughs> thinking about on this July 5th holiday. Let's take a look at what's coming up ahead. The OPEC Plus Alliance is due to meet, again, you heard the UAE minister demanding time to talk. Well, um, those talks have been halted twice. The standoff between the UAE and the rest of the group has so far left markets in limbo over the future of production. On Wednesday, Allen and Company's Sun Valley Conference, the big famous media turned tech, now back to tech conference kicks off. Jeff Bezos, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, and Tim Cook are all among those invited. The guest list is long and it's going to be sweet. Also on Wednesday, we're going to get minutes from the latest FOMC meeting, as well as U.S. job openings data. For May, we'll be paying close attention to the jolts this week. And on Friday, G20 finance ministers meet in Venice at what has got to be a fantastic time to be there, because there's no cruise ships around Venice. There aren't the <laughs> tourists that usually ruin the experience. Not sure how much time they'll be able uh, to, you know, used to see the sites, but um, Janet Yellen will be there, uh, and it's a gathering that is supposed to be the deadline to wrap up talks on the plans for a global minimum tax. So we'll see if they can get everybody on board for that. Francine? Yeah, I don't know how it's sightseeing, but certainly uh, it is, I've heard from reliable sources, family in Venice, that actually it's less busy than usual. Now, the standoff continues within the OPEC Plus Alliance as Saudi Arabia has pushed back against the UAE's opposition to a proposed production increase. In an unprecedented move, both countries have aired their grievances on television. First, the UIA, UIA uh, Energy Minister Sohail Al-Mazroy spoke to our Manus Cranny in Dubai. And just to be clear then, sir, you've not threatened to leave OPEC, and right now you're not prepared to threaten to leave if you don't get a deal. No, I think, I think if we don't get a deal, then we have an agreement to, to fulfill. We are, not, we are not now close even to elapsing that agreement. We are not threatening to walk away from the agreement. We're not threatening, we haven't threatened anyone. UAE okay. is not going to be an obstacle in front of anyone. But we are not going to threaten. That is not our strategy. We okay. are. We we have been sacrificed. We sacrificed a lot. We will continue 
to sacrifice until the end of this agreement. That's our commitment. But beyond that, we have the right to discuss and we, we demand to have the time to discuss and put our grievance in front of the group. Well, responding to the UAE, Saudi Energy Minister Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. I would emphasize that it is the whole group mm -hmm. versus one country, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is sad to me, but uh, this is the reality today. And how concerned are you if there is no agreement and potentially we could see what we saw last year, which becomes a price war? We, we have an existing agreement, Mary. I keep reminding people, unlike what you had in March, we have an existing agreement. We will honor that agreement. We will continue with it. The agreement requires that we bring more production, yes, but to complete that honor, honoring the agreement, we should kickstart what is mentioned in that agreement, which is we have to extend. Again, the extension put people, lots of people in their comfort zone. It brings volumes to address the, the short term, but it also address for the market. Check with all those who are participant uh, in this market. Tell the them. Current agreement, is, if maybe not if it, extended, has no production increase for August. So if not every member signs up tomorrow, what happens in August? Well, it's your chance to have an, another maybe interview to, with me tomorrow or after tomorrow. It depends on how we will finish. Are you worried we could see a massive spike in prices because the market is in need of more supply for the month of August. If some people would like to have that, they, they, they can do that. Is, is it our uh, uh, intent? No. Because if it is our intent, why would we do the proposal? And why we would work with our colleagues? It's been a two-month affair. If you're on board with the proposal, Russia and the rest of OPEC is, and there's just one holdout, and that's the UAE. Will you continue to increase by 400,000 barrels a day without the UAE on board? We cannot. Because it's an agreement that is done by consensus. Well, that was Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern talking exclusively to the Saudi energy minister, Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman, and Manus Krani speaking with the UAE's oil minister on the SPAT dividing OPEC plus. Now let's get more on this pretty big spat with our Bloomberg executive editor for energy and commodities, Will Kennedy. Will, thank you for joining us. We also spoke to Jeff Curry a little bit earlier on and he says, look, OPEC plus will likely approve a deal without an extension. What happens if they don't? What happens if they don't? I think it's a little unclear. Um, as, <clears throat> as you heard the prince say, you know, uh, then the current agreement stays in place, which would have them uh, stick at existing uh, production levels until next spring, which, as Anne-Marie said, would be probably extremely bullish for prices because the market is expecting 400,000, uh, was expecting 400,000 barrels a day next month and in subsequent months. And if the impasse continues, that might not get it. But there is a risk on the other side, of course, that this leads to a complete breakdown in OPEC. Now, Mazrui, in his interview with Manus, obviously clearly walked back from the idea of uh, the UAE leaving OPEC, but the risks are still there that this breaks down the alliance and that, you know, people have the opportunity to put more oil into the market. So I think one of the reasons you've seen prices not move a huge amount today is because you can construct arguments, narratives in both directions, and traders really need to see the outcome of today's meeting before they can take a position. So, Will, as I understand it, then... Good. If they leave the agreement in place, that's pretty bullish for prices, but not as bullish as an unraveling of OPEC would be bearish, right? The risk is pretty asymmetric because if they if this spat continues and blows up, then you could have a price war once again. Yeah, I don't think anyone's uh, saying that's a, a, a likely scenario at the moment, Matt, but it is a possibility. Um, and we saw a year ago uh, the what that kind of price war can do to the markets. But I would be cautious on that scenario. Clearly, a year ago, that was something that the Saudis were thinking about going into that meeting in Vienna, uh, March 2020. They had game plans and scenarios in case the 
um, everything broke down. I think at this stage that isn't happening and that everyone is trying to find a route forward. But it's clear from the interviews that we had yesterday that both sides here, the key players, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are very entrenched. I think it will be very interesting to hear from the Russians today. They are the other key player here. We haven't heard from the last couple of years. They will be desperate for a deal uh, to happen. So maybe they're the key to unlocking something. Well, it does seem remarkable that the, this dispute is taking place in such a public forum. Hearing from these energy ministers on Bloomberg, uh, basically debating each other via this television network. I mean, do we have any idea whether they're talking behind doors with those lines of communication look like or, or are they breaking down? I think you're exactly right, Danny, to say that this is an indication that things are not going well. When you when you end up in this sort of public war of words, it's not a sign that there are meaningful diplomatic efforts going on behind the scenes. And I think that's our understanding. We had heard perhaps that Kuwait was trying to broker a deal at one point. But as we understand it, and you know, there may be things happening that we don't know about, but our best information of this is that, as I say, these positions remain very in entrenched. Going public like this will raise feelings and see, force people to see it personally. So, um, you know, we'll just have to see what happens at this meeting. But I, I don't think right now there is a meaningful diplomatic uh, effort underway to solve this. That might change, but right now it doesn't seem to be that. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, again, when you speak to, you know, the head of commands at Goldman Sachs, he says, look, it's very uncertain, or I think the exact words is extremely unlikely that this will degenerate into the price war that we saw between Russia and Saudi Arabia last year. But is this just because they, they can't afford for it to degenerate and have an impact on the oil price? Is there, when you look at the, you know, the drama uh, between these two countries, how much of it is political and how much of it is actually to do with the oil price? I think for the Emiratis, it really is about their oil industry and the constraints that they feel that this deal puts on the oil industry. They are right to say that they give up more spare capacity than any other nation in the OPEC alliance to keep this agreement on track. So the extension for them is a problem because they were expecting that situation to end next spring. And now everyone wants it to continue towards the end of 2022. That said, I think that the Saudis and others in OPEC would argue the Emiratis expanded production of their own volition. And it's not their problem that the Emiratis are so constrained. So there are arguments mm. on both sides. Um, I think you're right to say that they don't want it to break down. So, sorry, to go back to your question, yes, it's mostly about oil, but clearly the political uh, alliance between Abu Dhabi and Riyadh isn't what it wants. In the background here, there are yeah. other tensions that we've seen in differing strategy about over the war in Yemen, for example. So I think oil first, but the political background probably isn't helping yet here. Well, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities there, Will Kennedy. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the oil markets. We'll also look at FX in depth. And then the other story is not only Didi and China cracking down, but it's that ransomware. Full story coming up. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacroix and Danny Berger in London. Kaylee Lines is off today for the 4th of July holiday into the 5th of July. Now, jobs in the U.S. jumped by the most in 10 months despite unemployment ticking slightly higher. A mixed report supporting the Fed's patient approach as hawkish bets fade. This jobs report was actually pretty mixed. This is a mixed report. Some mixed points to this. For every positive thing you point to, there's something less less positive. Both kind of bulls and bears in the economy have something to chew on. There's a little bit here for everybody. You have to step back and put some perspective, though, on it. It's about supply, not demand. Supply-side bottlenecks, um, you know, that are pushing up prices are actually impacting real activity as well. People pour over the jobs report uh, because they're wondering what the Fed's going to do with it. And I think the answer is... It confirms a wait and see approach. What happens if, if you let the inflation genie out of the bottle? And Look at what's happening in wages. 3.6% was the average uh, hourly earnings growth. It baffles me that they haven't started tapering already. There's just too much liquidity. Lots of unanswered questions that will need to be answered. 
All right, so we have um, some interesting data for the moment, Francine. Of course, we're all waiting for the jolts data, and as we know, things yeah. could turn on a dime here, but I don't know, maybe this is why rates on the 10 years stayed so low? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, Matt, you know, we look at the data, we look at maybe what the ECB also says on inflation, and oil is probably the biggest unknown when you look at, you know, the price of oil and how that could feed into inflation, how maybe the Fed and other now central banks is. view inflation going forward. It is this week, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, there are a lot of people out there who still see inflation as something more than transitory. But what I can't get through my head is, are we really that afraid of 3% inflation or 4% inflation, given what, uh, you know, Eddie and I have lived through, I guess you and Danny probably not. We, we saw much higher inflation <laughs> when I was a kid. Let's bring in Eddie Vandervault right now, Bloomberg M Live editor. Actually, I'm sorry to assume that you're as old I'll, as I am, I'll Eddie, because I know you're not quite. <laughs> I'll take the compliment. Quite, <laughs> take the compliment. quite I think that I'm probably old. older, but let's not. Look, I, 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 I'm have... probably old, but let's not go into that. I've just no, aged let's, well. Let's, um, yeah, let's keep it private. Uh, what, what do you think about the inflation <laughs> debate and where the Fed is considering a 10-year uh, Treasury at 142 right now? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm with you. I, I accept that, you know, inflation running a little bit hot when the, when the uh, central bankers have so much uh, firepower in reserve, right? It's not as if they've been fighting inflation and have not been able to control it. They've had a number of years where they've not been able to get it above target or anywhere near target in the case of the eurozone. So I think they would be quite comfortable in seeing inflation pick up. But I think there is a generation of people for whom inflation is such a terrible memory that you know they they, they they just don't want to ever go back there again so I think there's a there's a number of people who, who are so worried about this that you know any any beat above target will be seen as extremely negative at the same time you've got assets like cryptocurrencies that have sprung into life purely because people have said look you know the central bankers are experimenting they don't know what they're doing with your money and you know the whole thing's going to end in tears so i think there's that narrative in the background that's playing as well eddie thank you so much eddie van der Waal there from our m live team we'll get back to eddie shortly now coming up a little bit later this morning joshua sharfstein he's johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health vice dean we'll ask him of course about the variant uh, covid and also mask wear this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacko with Matt Miller and Danny Berger. Kaylee Lines is off today. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. And President Biden has all but announced an end to the pandemic in the United States. He celebrated what he called a heroic vaccination campaign on the country's Independence Day holiday. Now the president missed his goal of having at least 70% of adults in the U.S. getting at least one dose of vaccine. The total is now 67%. The hackers behind a mass ransomware attack exploited previously unknown vulnerabilities in management software made by Casilla. Well, that's according to cybersecurity researchers. Hundreds of businesses were affected by the attack. A Russian-based hacking group is suspected. We'll have plenty more, of course, on these stories throughout the day. Now, coming up, Holger Schmieding, Chief Economist at Bearberg, will ask him about the price of oil, will ask him about inflation. And I know Matt Miller also wants to talk about the German elections. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacko with Matt Miller and Danny Berger. Katie Lines is off today. Matt, a lot of the focus, I mean, a lot of the focus is the day after the 4th of July. Let's be real. So the market may be a little bit less in terms of volume, but the focus is also firmly on this terrible spat within OPEC. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really um, dramatic and fascinating to watch 
Um, that as well as the DD situation, right? Because the OPEC situation, you can sort out and you can understand the moving parts. The UAE wants to change the baseline. Nobody else wants to let that happen because then everybody would get to change the baseline. Um, totally get it. With the DD thing, does China, is China angry that Didi has the data because they want the data? You assume that China has the data if Didi has the data, right? So, or is it just mm. an elaborate prank on U.S. investors who just bought Didi shares last <laughs> week? Um, oh, it seems the timing like there's- is incredible. <laughs> yeah, the timing is unreal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I, I, you have to wonder, okay, obviously, this is a big deal for China tech in general, but what does it mean for the U.S. IPO right. market? We have so many Chinese uh, companies listed in the U.S., Francine. I mean, does this mean no one will well, ever want to do it again? Danny, I think it was probably a very clear message for U.S. investors that played into the IPO. So, I mean, I don't know if that's really playing out in the markets or whether, mm -hmm. you know, it's really oil and inflation concerns. It, that definitely make... seems to be what's capturing the attention of the market. Yeah, Matt? I want to just make one point because you hit on something really interesting, Danny. Does that mean nobody else is going to want to invest in this in this in these companies again? And Shuli Ren mm -hmm. has a great piece on Bloomberg Opinion. Um, the Chinese have an expression for U.S. investors that bought DD. It's called chives, <laughs> and the reason is you can harvest them and they grow right back up again. So I think. Some people, at least, feel like these U.S. investors are just going to keep buying in no matter mm. how much they get the rug pulled out from under them. Uh, I highly recommend checking out Shuli Ren's column. Well, that's kind of the appeal of the U.S. market in general, right, Matt? I mean, we continue to see yes. new record after new record. I mean, it's no wonder that if you're going to list, and especially if you're a big tech company, that that's where you would want to be. And, and, and let's go ahead and look and see how the markets are doing so far this morning. I do have a China board for us in just a little bit, uh, which is remarkably unshaken. Now, you are seeing S&P 500 futures lower this morning. Unlikely, it's just because of the DD stuff. I mean, look, there's barely any volume both here in bond futures just because uh, you know it is the 5th of July the day after 4th of July holiday so not a lot of trading going on there and Francine as you were saying really what's capturing the attention is what's happening in OPEC oil not moving a ton it's still around a 2018 high but because there are two very different outcomes a very bullish one or a very bearish one depending on whether we get an agreement whether the UAE uh, comes back to the table or not there's a lot of variety so you don't want to make too big of a bet it's in a very nervous and tight market finally we are seeing a little bit more weakness in the dollar now let me quickly show you what happened uh, in the Chinese session and it was you know, a so-so day ended up about one-tenth of a percent higher. Now, part of the reason we maybe didn't see that big of a sell-off was that Friday was just really, really tough in the equity market in China. It had its worst sell-off in about four months. So people going back in buying, but even tech ending higher the day in the day during today's session. Uh, Europe, on the other hand, under a bit more pressure when it comes to the trading session today. It's basically unchanged to a little bit lower. Uh, the thing that's keeping it afloat really is basic resources when you have commodities going higher again. And Matt, I come back to the W.M. Morrison story, shares up more than 11 percent. One thing that caught my eye was analysts over at SockGen saying that, OK, now you have all these private equity funds bidding for Morrison's. It's also helping give a lift to Marks and Spencer's, for example. Maybe Amazon could be a player here. Maybe Amazon wants to come in and make a bid now that they know that Morrison is for sale, too. I mean, that definitely would garner a well, much higher price for Morrison than any private equity company could put up. Wasn't, wasn't there already a cautionary tale with a huge U.S. retailer buying a U.K. supermarket chain that just didn't go so well? I'm thinking Walmart and Asda. Yes. Yes, and, and funny yes. it should happen that that one ended up being bought by a private equity fund in the end also. Yeah, well, we'll see how the exits are if they actually get, if private equity actually gets in mm. um, to these. I am tuned in. Right now, let's talk about, <laughs> well, we haven't touched on coronavirus at all. So it's, it's, I feel like it's time. The Delta variant spread across the U.S. threatening to cloud recovery outlooks, putting a growing chorus of investors on edge. The Delta variant. The Delta variant. The spread of the Delta variant. The Delta variant is going to be an issue. Definitely, it is right now the key tail risk to watch. The risk is there. It's what the major visible risk. And it could potentially derail things. The travel restrictions are still in place in many countries. That can open the pathway for, for lockdowns 
um, for lockdowns later. Economic uh, growth forecasts could roll over. But the issue is that the central bank's responsibility is also for looking at the economy and inflation. This is the risk that we all have, uh, you know, on our radar, right? Uh, the Fed crunching the recovery. That's still the big uncertainty. Central banks have to calibrate very, very carefully. Joining us now is Holger Schmieding, chief economist at Berenberg. Holger, I wonder how bad or how scary the Delta variant really is in the Western world now that anyone who chooses to is able to get vaccinated and those who have been vaccinated are at a, a far lower risk of becoming seriously ill, um, certainly very unlikely to be hospitalized and incredibly unlikely to die from this. So is it really that big of a problem here? I would say it is a big risk that we need to watch. As economists, we can't really judge the medical situation, but we do follow the data very closely. And the data do show that so far, indeed, as you said, um, among populations where many people have been vaccinated, serious medical complications are fairly rare. And that probably means that we will not be heading for new serious and crippling restrictions. It's early days, but the evidence such as that from the UK is in this sense encouraging. There is also a political angle to that. As the medical complications seem to be largely occurring, the few among those who have not been inoculated, um, the political argument is once there are enough vaccines for everybody to have the ability to get a shot, at least for those above a certain age group, then the political reason that in order to protect those that have not been inoculated, um, we need to have blanket restriction, that political reason basically goes away. Those who have had the chance to get inoculated but haven't chosen to do so are probably not the ones which the rest of the population would take restrictions or accept restrictions to protect. So in other words, our economic base case remains no new harsh restrictions. Yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, what does that mean for the drag on the economy? That means the drag on the economy will likely be minimal. We have seen already that kind of from wave to wave to wave of infections, the economic reaction to that has declined, declined and declined. In the UK at the moment, we see a modest drop in footfall, retail, recreation, grocery. But we do not see other indicators, such as what we just got, the services PMI, showing any significant damage. Instead, they were strong. So we seem to be, in countries where most of the adults have been inoculated, we seem to be seeing a decoupling of the economy from the infection situation. In other words, we are returning to a situation that we economists would normally sort of call normal, that the medical situation is something to be watched, but not the prime mover of our economic forecast. Okay, if these economic picture then, if the data coming in then does suggest, Holger, that we're starting to get an improvement, how do you contrast that with, for example, a market where credit spreads are really tight, things that kind of seem to scream late cycle economy? How do you square the two? I don't think we are like late cycle economy. We do have, of course, to watch inflation risk, which is a bit of a late cycle phenomenon, yes. But in terms of the underlying economic dynamic, we likely have a long period of fairly strong growth ahead of us. We have the rebound from the pandemic. We have a strong monetary and fiscal stimulus. We have excess savings. We have on the business side a need to invest more and to replenish inventories. So we are, in terms of demand, nowhere near a late cycle situation. We have to watch inflation, that's true, but central banks are a bit more tolerant of inflation as they used to be. So for the time being, it looks likely central banks will take the foot off the accelerator gradually, but they will not step on the brakes and end the cycle. So I'm not that concerned about late cycle rhetoric. Holger, what's more dangerous for the economy right now? Is it something going wrong with OPEC plus and the agreement, or is it too much stimulus at exactly the wrong time? I don't think that we should worry too much about OPEC. I'm not an expert on that, but these spats will likely get resolved before they turn into something that's really serious for the world economy, beyond, say, the impact on markets for a few uh, days or weeks, if we are unlucky. Um, of course, overheating, too much stimulus is a bit of a concern. Having said that, 
we probably are beyond the biggest stimuli. I don't think there will be other big stimulus checks sent out to U.S. households in the future. It will be a more measured and more supply-friendly programs, hopefully on more infrastructure spending, for example. And hence, with no further stimulus checks in the U.S., we'll probably see more kind uh, workers who probably sort of don't bother to really look for a job, return to the labor market and ease the labor supply constraints a bit. I'm not, I'm a bit worried, but not too worried about yeah. this too much stimulus at the moment. Holger, thank you so much. Holger meeting their chief economist at Berenberg. Now, coming up, China's tech crackdown continues. Beijing has banned ride-hailing giant Didi from app stores days after its U.S. IPO. All of the details next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackwith, Matt Miller, and Danny Berger. Kaylee Lines is off today. Now, China is expanding its cybersecurity review of tech firms. Right hailing giant Didi was removed from app stores on Sunday, just days after its U.S. listing. The Chinese government backed Global Times newspaper says Beijing is acting for national security reasons. Well, to uh, talk about all of this is John Liu, Bloomberg News Executive Editor for Greater China. He joins us now from Beijing. John, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at the timing of this, is this also to try and get to U.S. investors because of its recent IPO in New York? Uh, the exact uh, sort of thought process behind the timing here is a little bit unclear. I think it, it, it's worth mentioning that uh, national security, data security is more in the limelight than it's ever been. Uh, just as China is doing this review of Didi, you know, it should be mentioned that Washington is also doing this review of companies like TikTok, whether those operations, TikTok's operations in the U.S., are putting the data of American citizens uh, exposing that to the Chinese government. Yeah, so the Chinese government is going to know all the dances that American teenagers are doing. I wonder who has access to Didi's data. I mean, we you have to assume, right, that the, the party can access any Chinese company's data it sees fit to access. But is the concern that the U.S. may also have access to Chinese consumer data? So uh, that the Global Times article that we mentioned earlier, that actually uh, noted that the data that Didi has on where people travel day in and day out, there's so much of it that you could work out a pattern, and that would be a national security concern. They also note that the two biggest shareholders in Didi are SoftBank and Uber, two foreign companies. Uber, obviously, an American company. So I think mm. the concern being suggested there is that the shareholders not being Chinese is somewhat of a security threat. Yeah, SoftBank not exactly having the best run over the past couple of years, are they? Um, John, there are also other firms that China has announced that they're looking into as well. Can we derive any hints from, you know, sort of the, all the companies that they're investigating? If there are any common takeaways that can lend us to understand exactly why they're looking at them? So the two other companies that have been announced uh, that are under scrutiny are uh, the Full Truck Alliance, which is sort of a, an Uber DD for trucking, and then also uh, Kanjong Limited, which operates a, a job posting recruiting website. I, I think all, both those websites have data about people, personnel, what people are doing, what they've done, where they've worked. Uh, I think it shows that this, uh, the political tensions between the U.S. and China, they're more in the market than they've ever been. You obviously also have uh, Washington, uh, looking at banning American investment in Chinese companies listed in the U.S. So uh, I think this is just showing uh, an intensification of that. John, thank you so much. John Liu there, Bloomberg News Executive Editor for Greater China, of course, reporting from Beijing. And I know the story will run and run, so we'll look at different angles, of course, with our reporting team on the ground. Coming up, billionaires race to space. We'll bring you some of our interview with the Galactic or Virgin Galactic Chief Executive Michael Colts-Glazier. That's up next, and this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger with Francine Lacroix and Matt Miller. Kaylee Lines is off today. Now, Richard Branson is planning to fly to space on July the 11th, and that's just days before a similar trip by fellow billionaire Jeff Bezos. The CEO of Virgin Galactic discussed founder Branson's plans with Bloomberg Sky Johnson and Kaylee Lines. We do now have a clear uh, license from the FAA to do commercial sales. That won't happen until 22 after um, we finish the flight test. However, after the second of these up next two upcoming flights, uh, as planned, we will be reopening up sales to the marketplace, and we're excited for that moment. That'll be late summer, early fall. Well, that was the chief executive of Virgin Galactic. Now, a look at what else we're watching today. There's a lot going on. Danny, OPEC, I mean, this is probably the big one, a meeting again today. It is, and, and I have to say, it probably doesn't bode well, as we were discussing with Will Kennedy, that a lot of the debates seem to be taking place across Bloomberg TV. I mean, they're going very, very public right with for it. Us. So, yeah, exactly. It's going to be really interesting to see, you know, what does that evolve into? Are we going to continue to get a more uh, public view of the disagreements that they're having, Matt? I mean, it, it means a lot for the oil market here because the potential outcomes are so extreme. Yeah, I'd have to agree that that is uh, the number one issue to watch for markets right now. Definitely keep your eye on what happens and we'll continue to have, well, you saw the Saudi oil minister inviting Anne-Marie to interview him again tomorrow so yeah, maybe we'll get more yeah. of uh, that I'm gonna also be watching the UK supermarket battle because I know I make fun very often but I do care I have my own favorite UK supermarkets I've got them listed in order I don't think it'd be fair to say right now <laughs> but Waitrose makes the best cheesecake in the world uh, we'll be watching to see who takes over Morrison and if any Brits step up I'm not advocating for protectionist measures from the government. I'm just thinking maybe some UK investor will think it's important enough um, to buy this supermarket chain. And the, to me, Francine, the most interesting thing I, is I they love. own like almost all of their stores. I think they own like 85% mm. of their real estate, yeah. which must make it worth more. Yeah. Matt, I just, I love the fact that you live in Berlin. I haven't lived in, in the UK for quite some time, but still have a list of favorite supermarkets. That's why we love Matt Miller. Mm. He's always on the The ball. BLTs at M&S are delicious. Oh, there, there you are go. Good. Supply chain disruptions raising costs for European companies as firms pass on higher prices to consumers amid surging demand. Well, the French industry minister, Agnès Pannier-Runacher, weighed in. Is now to uh, have the most people being vaccinated in the less time possible uh, and to ensure that we have a close monitoring of the circulation of the variant. And this is exactly what we are doing. We don't have issue with a uh, uh, number of vaccine doses. Uh, the people are getting vaccinated. We don't have a, a, a threshold yet, but we do know that at a point of time, we may have this uh, threshold of uh, vaccination and we will need to push more vaccination among people. So it is possible that uh, this Delta variant could derail the very high growth forecast that France is enjoying at the moment, 5% uh, for 2021. It's possible it could derail this forecast? We don't think so because we have taken a cautious uh, uh, figures. As you know, we say 5% in C is now saying 6%. Uh, we will not move our targets because, uh, you know, it can go up and down and uh, we want to be uh, to have a steady approach. Uh, but I'm confident that we can deliver this 5%. The pandemic has also had a dramatic impact on the prices of raw materials causing inflation. Uh, do you think uh, this uh, will have also an impact on uh, French growth uh, and this will have an impact, a lasting impact on the French industry? We have some uh, factories that have to slow down their production. They have a huge backlog, but they don't have the parts to produce yet because there are huge delays in production in Asia or other um, parts of the world. Uh, when it comes to pricing, uh, by the end of the year, we believe that the inflation should be, you know, uh, in, in a acceptable uh, level. We don't have uh, warnings regarding that. But once again, this has to be closely monitored. And that's why we're anticipating it by having some policies to re-implement, to relocate uh, some production in Europe 
en France and, and, and to have a near-shoring approach. President Macron is planning to revive the very controversial pension reform quite soon, uh, before the end of his mandate, obviously, and the presidential elections in 2022. Uh, Do you think um, it's the right time, uh, even though it could create uh, another uh, very tense social climate and possibly return of the Yellow Vest protest, for example? President Macron has always been clear that he would not stop reforming the country uh, because of uh, COVID or whatever. We need to transform France and we'll carry on implementing reforms. Having said that, we need to uh, have a pension uh, reform because at this moment of time, uh, this is uh, the scheme, the pension scheme is not balanced, it's not financed yet. That means that the younger one pay for the older one, but they don't have the insurance at all that they will benefit from the pension scheme at the level of the older one. And this is absolutely unacceptable. So we need to move forward with what calendar the president will tell, but for sure reforms are still important in France. Well, that was the French industry minister, Agnès Pannier-Runacher. We'll have plenty more on Bloomberg surveillance. This is Bloomberg.